IoT mean to my business? How can I leverage it? How can I actually use it to help my business? Now to get started, before our panel discussion, we have a, a presentation here just to kind of get everybody at the same level here. And so the first question is, you know, where does IIoT come from? And it really comes from IoT, the industrial, the, the internet of things. And you know, we all experience that every single day, right? I mean, it's on the cell phone in my pocket, might be on the Fitbit on your wrist, could be in your car, maybe it's the exercise equipment in your home, but we're seeing IoT products on everything that we own these days. So it's very, very commonplace. IoT is all about the technology of connecting devices. IIoT is a subset of that. So it's really that part of IoT that applies to our business. And because it's industrial related, there are some additional requirements we have to be worried, we have to be thinking about. So in most industrial facilities, we're talking about more devices, right? Sensors, drives, things that provide and create data for us. Those create data at higher data rates, not just the once a minute from our wrist, but maybe every second, maybe every several milliseconds it could be. And of course, with more data comes more storage requirements. Also, you know, the cost of it not working is higher in the industrial world than it is in our personal world. You know, if my Fitbit doesn't work, not the end of the world, right? But if, for instance, the edge device in my control system doesn't work, well now maybe my control system doesn't work or maybe the analytics, the predictive maintenance isn't working. So we do have some greater risk there. And finally, security is important. We gotta make sure that all that data is secure. It's not compromised, it's not hacked. IIoT is not a fad. It's not something that's here and now gonna go away. It's something that's gonna be here for a long time. And you can see that by the number of companies that are investing substantial dollars in this technology. And in fact, if you look at it, by the year 2021, it's projected to be a $123 billion business, probably one of the fastest growing sector of the industrial manufacturing space. So the question that people always ask is, what can IIoT provide me? Why do I even care about it? And I think it really depends upon your perspective, right? So if your perspective is as the end user, you're wondering about things like remote engineering support. Who can dial into my system and help get my processes up and running? Maybe machine benchmarking. How well do my machines work in comparison to the universe of machines? Predictive maintenance. When is there going to be some maintenance required? How can I get in front of that to plan for that and eliminate downtime? What kind of production visibility do I have in terms of how things are working, not just for the operator, but maybe for other people in the management team? Maybe I need to deploy other data and reports quickly, and I don't have that large IT staff I used to have, so can I do it myself? Can somebody on the operations side do something? How about machine learning? Can my machines learn how to better run? And maybe, in the future, artificial intelligence for process optimization. Now, if you're an OEM, some of these same things apply to you, right? I mean, you care about remote engineering support for your customers. You care about machine benchmarking and predictive maintenance. But maybe you also care about asset tracking. Where is your machine located? Because some of these machines get bought and sold. You want to be able to touch base with those customers. You want to alert them to improvements in your machines and processes. And if nothing else, you want to make sure that those machines are safe. Possibly, there are new sources of revenue for you. Maybe the information you collect from your machine and the universe of your machines is valuable to your customers to help them improve their manufacturing processes. And believe it or not, customers are willing to pay for that because it is valuable. Now, Standard Electric, you know, we've been involved in industrial controls and automation for many, many years. From simple things like networking PLCs to drives and operator interfaces. But we've been in the IIoT space for six or seven years. 
most directly through products that provide remote connectivity to control systems so that you can have secure access for maintenance and data gathering. We've also been there with operator interfaces. Not just the traditional operator, operator interface that's on a machine, but that type of product is also on your phone or on a tablet as well. We've been there with OEE type product, helping customers improve the overall equipment effectiveness of their machinery, monitoring things like key performance indicators and trying to measure how well is my production facility running. So we've been involved in this space and we're able to help our customers. And of course, we have many other suppliers that are joining this party. I mean, just walking the trade show today, you hear about people who are doing things with IIoT, or another term you hear is Industry 4.0. There's a lot of investment because I think our suppliers see this as a great value to our customers. Now going forward, you kind of have to talk in terms of a new model, right? It's not the same pyramid that you might have had before. So we can talk at this level here about connected products. And what's a connected product? It's something that can take information and transmit it upwards. So it's not just a siloed device all by itself, it's something which is smart and it has integrated communications. In the middle, you have the edge control. And that is taking that information, concentrating it, analyzing it, modifying it, perhaps presenting it to an operator at the, at the middle level, but maybe presenting it further up in the architecture. And the products that you see at this level, the edge level, they are PLCs like they've been in the past, but they're also operator interfaces, and they're also edge devices, uh, industrial PCs with uh, node-red-type uh, node operating systems or dedicated Windows-type operating systems. And then finally, up here at this top level, you have SCADA-type applications, but you also have products that are called advisors that give you windows or advice into your process. Or maybe they're providing you with some analytics that give you ideas as to how to optimize or improve your manufacturing process. So this is kind of our new model. And when you have the conversation today, you'll especially be hearing this term edge. What is edge control? And it's really this middle layer right here. All these layers are tied together with end-to-end -end cybersecurity. We want that transmission of data to be secure. We want it to be safe. And then you'll hear about some protocols. How do we get this data from the edge up into the cloud? And there are different protocols available, and some of them have pluses and minuses. We'll discuss that a little bit today as well. Now going forward, there are some organizational challenges too, right? It has been in the past that the operational people kind of view the IT people as adversaries. No longer in the possible in the future. They have to work together. Why? Because our staffs are leaner. And also because there's more overlap in these technologies, right? You're starting to see products that are IT related products on the factory floor. So there is that combination. You need to have collaboration, not competition. And we have a great guy today, Scott Slova, who can talk about that as well. So as this, product, as this technology develops, there are trends that we can watch, we can monitor, that are going to be important. So the first thing is, you can imagine all these connected devices are creating a lot of data. More devices, more data, so wireless technology is going to be key. One thing to monitor is 5G wireless. Why is that? It's because it has so much higher data transmission rates. It has support for many more devices on your factory floor, and it has reduced latency. And latency is that delay between when something happens and when it gets transmitted and we know about it. So those are some key things to monitor. Recently, our government has put a huge emphasis on 5G technology. We want to be world leaders in these standards as they develop. Another key technology is machine learning. 
how can we monitor those events that are happening at the machine level and draw conclusions as to how well the machine is running, how well it's going to continue to run, and when it needs to be repaired. So machine learning at the edge is going to be key. And the other one is artificial intelligence. If at the cloud we could be monitoring our process, what improvements might we make to help it become more effective? So you're going to see more artificial intelligence solutions that will help you improve your processes. So as we begin the discussion here, I'm really happy to invite our panelists to come forward. And first of all, I'd like to introduce three people from Standard Electric who really do a great job of working with our customers. So from the Chicago area, John Herdy, who is a business development specialist with Standard Electric. John, please come aboard. Many of you know Bill Hershinger, our Director of Engineering here in Milwaukee. Bill knows us for a long time. And Mike Boyda. And Mike uh, had been with us in Illinois, recently moved to Indiana, uh, but he does a lot of work on IIoT applications for our customers. Also, I want to introduce to you Brian Falcone from Insyncorator. I think you know, Brian and then also Scott uh, Slovic from Sholi IPN, they're going to be the people you really want to hear because not only have they heard us talk about it, but they've actually done it. And they're the people that you want to hear from as to what did they experience, what worked, what did work, how did they overcome the challenges they had. So what we're going to do is before we dive into the panel discussion, I'm going to ask Brian first to come up and share a little bit about his company, Insyncorator, and his application for IIoT. So okay. Brian, Thank come you. on board here. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry, I should have gone yeah, yeah, no, and finished the part. I'm sorry. Uh, the one thing I wanted to point out about our two panelists that is great is that we have both people from an OEM and an end user perspective. So Brian, working for the OEM, is the guy who's applied it in his machinery that benefits our customers in the field. For instance, I think you'll mention that Potawatomi, one of their customers right here. So Insyncorator, commonly known for the garbage disposals in our house, but really, there is an industrial version of their product too that you'll really be fascinated to hear about and hear how Brian has applied IIoT for those types of applications. And then also, Scott, from the end user side, how do you apply IIoT into a manufacturing environment? And his company, Sholi, which makes these great bag and box products. Anybody ever bought a boxed wine before? Most likely, their product is the box that holds that wine. So, Scott will talk about the challenges from an end user perspective of applying that product. Now, I think I can go ahead and turn it I over to you. I'm going to turn over to Brian here. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm going to talk about uh, one of the. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay, that's okay. I'm going to talk about one of our commercial products that is called Grind Energy. This is a non-sewer based product that uh, we use to recycle food waste in the commercial environment. Um, as we just discussed, Potawatomi is one of our uh, customers for this product, one of our first customers where we're grinding up all their food waste that would have normally been sent to a landfill. And what we're doing is grinding it up and putting it into a, a separate storage tank. So what you see in this picture is a processing table a 10 horsepower incinerator grinder, a pump, and this uh, what happens is as you process the food waste, it'll be sent off to the sto uh, a temporary storage tank where once it's full, the material will be removed from this, this tank and be sent to an anaerobic digester. And what happens with anaerobic digestion is the food's broken down and turned into methane uh, that can be used for electricity, uh, heat, alternate vehicle fueling or whatever. In the byproduct, once the methane is created, uh, the byproduct of this process can be used as fertilizer. So it's 100% uh, renewable, uh, and it, again, diverts food from the landfill, which is what we're trying to accomplish with this product here. Um, 
So this, this is the product we'll be discussing today. There are sensors all over the system. Uh, we're, we're monitoring the temperature of the tank for uh, the, the customers that are in cold climate areas. We have pump pressure, pipe pressure, pump motor currents. We're monitoring water flow. And the system does have some smarts to it as well. So on the fly within our controller, we notice that if we notice that the, the motor currents of the grinder is working too hard, we know to add a little bit extra water because they must be grinding some difficult materials, like some dry breads. Uh, and once the current drops back down, we're able to automatically get the water back down to one gallon a minute. Uh, so with this system, and, and as I mentioned, we have all these sensors that's sending data. Uh, it's, all our customers are remote, so we use cellular connectivity on all our devices. Uh, but, but all the data is sent uh, cellularly to a dashboard. And this is uh, one, of our, one of two of our dashboards. This is the first dashboard is an administrative dashboard. This is what we use to really just do a system health check of all our customers. We can come in first thing in the morning, see who's online, uh, we have status, so if the system has been down for three hours, we'll get different symbols. We have some code written that does that for us. We can look at their tank levels to see who's uh, ready to be full and when we need to schedule uh, a hauler to come empty that storage tank. Uh, we can look at tank temperatures, especially in the cold weather. If they start getting down to certain low temperatures, there may be an issue with their heating on the outside. But uh, we also have alarm logging. So what we do is we have a 15 minute daily stand up, we come in in the morning, our operations and service group, we review the, the, the data. Again, it's overall system health. What alarms did we get at which sites and do we need to respond to it at the, right away in the morning? Uh, so in, in addition, as I mentioned, we have two dashboards. Uh, the first administrative, in addition to that, we have a customer facing dashboard. This is a little bit newer for us, so we're still learning, but. With the data, we realize that the customer also has uh, information, or we have information that we can share with our customer that's valuable to them. So the customer can come in here and look at the amount of waste processed across their sites. And they can use that for trending or to see if there's uh, issues across multiple stores. Uh, for example, if it's a grocery store. Uh, they can look at the, um, the service hours. How, how much did the system run last night? Did people grind a lot of food or, or not? Uh, and then it also does some sustainability reporting. So not only can they check that their health and, and trends of their usage of our system, but they can also go and do some sustainability reporting. And what this is, is uh, a customer can log in, pick a time slot, figure out how much food, I shouldn't say figure out, it automatically tells how much food they ground up over that period of time. Uses the water data that we already, that they're sending with our, with our IoT, back the water out and we have just the amount of food that they've diverted from landfills. And they can print out these sustainability reports which is with a press of a button and share this on their website. Like Sendix is a, a customer of ours in the area and they, they share their sustainability reporting on their website showing how much food was diverted from a landfill and, and converted into electricity. Great. Scott, would you share a little bit about the Sholey application, please? Sure. Uh, my name is Scott Slovic. I work, I'm the IT uh, manager, global manager for Sholey Packaging. Um, we're in the, we're the pioneers of the bag and box industry. We started building our own machines. Some of our machines are 30, 40 plus years old. Um, we make, uh, have maintenance. We purchased new bag and box machines recently, just within the last couple of years. We've uh, acquired a, a pouch manufacturing company in Europe. So if you guys have seen, like for the kids, the Go Go Sweets pouch, uh, those little caps that go on there, we make millions, billions of those caps. Uh, so we're a manufacturing company. We also, believe it or not, Mike said, uh, besides end user and monitoring our own manufacturing globally, we're, uh, we do make filling equipment as well too, kind of a mini OEM business within the Sholey organization. And we kind of, so similar to like uh, you know, the razor blade analogy, we try to uh, get a bag sales contract that we can provide customers with filling equipment. That's kind of where I started with this IoT uh, at Sholey is I was uh, uh, purchasing E1 devices because my field service team needed to be able to uh, uh, monitor the equipment, oops, wrong direction here, monitor the, the equipment that we have in the field 
uh, for a period of time once the factory and site acceptance testing is done. So the E1 was a perfect fit for that. Um, internally, then I got put on this project to do um, data monitoring of our manufacturing. So we're a global company around the world, and what we've done is we're monitoring our bag machines, injection molding machines, assembly, uh, we do blown film extrusion, we make our own films as well too. So we have new and old equipment, variety of different PLCs, Siemens controls, Allen Bradley, you name it. Um, before, before I had this project, uh, Sholey being multi-site, every site had some kind of data monitoring their own, whether it be a Rockwell product, Wonderware, or homegrown system. And it just wasn't capable of putting all that data together. So that's where uh, a team was put together, and eventually they decided upon the uh, Iconix product suite. And we implemented that uh, several years ago. And it's been an ongoing progression of improvements and uh, data that we're getting out of the system. Um, just showing uh, some examples of how uh, even older machines, this is a picture of a machine, uh, an injection molding machine had no controls to it at all. What they'll see. So just get a micro PLC with an HMS wireless bolt, wire it up, and we can get data off of the machine. Uh, our existing ones as well, uh, we've used every aspect of the E1 products. I've got extrusion machines that have no Ethernet capability. We simply put in a flexi unit that had data highway connection, and I can get data off of that as well too. Then we went from the SCADA system, uh, you can see here, just collecting the tags, uh, automating using iPads for scrap entry, and uh, input of data. Let me go one more there. And then from the uh, customized uh, user interfaces that we've put out on the floor itself, so the operators can see in real time OE, um, and then SBC data by machine. Um, we've got the uh, andons for visibility of real-time data as well, how the machine is performing. We're pulling data from our ERP system. And then end result is we're getting uh, nice, clean reporting. Uh, we use, actually, we started just pulling the data into an Excel spreadsheet. But for those that are Excel challenged with pivot tables, I use Microsoft Power BI, push that all that data up in the cloud. And it's a standard report that every single Sholey organization around the world, whether it be in China, Australia, they can see anybody's site to see how anybody's machine is running. Whether it be by the date, the shift, the department that they're in, or down to the asset level that they want. So we can get OE. This is just a simple screenshot, but you can see here, uh, I can get down to uh, downtime, scrap, uh, machine alarm history, and everything within there. So that's just an overview of what I'm doing at show. Great, thanks a lot. All right, so now let's kind of begin the panel discussion here. So we've got a few questions here, and of course this is all interactive. It becomes best when you guys ask questions, but we'll kind of start it off here. And so, as I've been talking to people about IIoT, there's a lot of industry talk, and we hear about it from writers, we hear about it from suppliers who are here, and it seems like it's an obvious technology to embrace, but you know, some of our customers are reluctant. So I guess I'd like to ask Brian and Scott, you know, were your IIoT investments obvious? And uh, how did you justify these investments? And you know, did the in implementations turn out as you expected? So Brian, maybe you could start and talk about that a little bit. Yeah, um, I, I would say the need was obvious. Um, scalability of what we what I shared. We have sites all over the country, and uh, we have tanks filling. And at, when we first started, it was a manual process of watching tank levels and trying to schedule pickups of hauling across the country. And we realized as our customer base grew, uh, we just couldn't hire that many people to, uh, to manage that process. So, so the need was definitely there, um, but the cost was unknown to us because we manufacture garbage disposals, and this is a brand new, right? What, what is IoT? I don't know. And, and that's where we started this process. So um, I would say um, it was a journey. You know, we, we didn't just launch it and here we are. We had to pivot a few times. 
we started down the path of an industrial PLC, and um, we were heading that way for a while, and then we switched over to a, a custom microcontroller, and then we ended up settling on a, a cellular RTU, the Redline uh, RTU, uh, which is, has been really great for us to this point. So uh, I guess to answer the question, we, the need was known, but, but the cost was uh, a really a learning experience. Was it hard to convince people this was the path you should take, or was it you all were on the same page? There? I think because, as I mentioned, the scalability of, of our business, we knew what we had wasn't scalable. We put a business plan together showing that and showing the benefits. And, and even without the customer portal side, just the administrative side of our business, uh, it went through pretty, pretty easily, I would say. Okay, good, good. Scott, how about you? Tell me a little bit about your implementation, the history there. The, uh, the implementation at Sholey IP Ed, um, before I actually was able on this project, one of the things is Sholey is a sustainable company. That's one of our big initiatives. So, you know, managing our scrap output and manufacturing is a big one. And we wanted to be able to see that detail level. Um, one of the other things that generated a business return on investment right away was our quality um, claims that come in. Sholey, if we have leaking bags, uh, one of the things about Sholey that makes our product better than it really is that we, you know, we account for the bag as well as the loss of the product that's, that you fill in the bag. So uh, going back in time, we were a paper-based system. So it took, it could take days for our team to investigate a claim, going through all the paperwork of what happened on this day, well, how was the machine outputting, what lot came from that machine. Um, it was just unacceptable. So we had to have a solution to provide uh, faster access to get that data from the machine uh, out to a customer to tell what exactly what happened. Got it. And was, as you went through the implementation, were there a lot of surprises in there, or is this like a normal journey, you think? No, there was, I mean, uh, as we moved along, we found other obvious initiatives that uh, paid for itself, too. I mean, being a manufacturing, going from, you know, break fix, uh, reactive, to trying to be more proactive on that machine downtime, because if these machines aren't running, we're not making money. Got it. Okay. Mike Boyda, you talked to a lot of customers about IIoT. What are the typical challenges that they face in justifying implementations? Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think one of the biggest challenges most people get stuck with is uh, trying to uh, trying to embrace too many uh, too many solutions or too many uh, anticipated solutions to answers that they quite frankly don't know exactly what all the answers are. Clearly, that they don't they actually try to uh, uh, start with a very complex model and uh, simply is that my recommendation is, is to start simple. So the biggest challenge is probably have some sort of simple plan in place and uh, I, I will challenge anybody the first question I asked when they asked me about IOT I said could you write on a piece of paper exactly what you'd like to see and surprisingly enough about 99% of people are capable so they have to have at least some idea of what they want to do, and they tend to make it over complex and try to make choices on both equipment and perhaps some of the uh, presentation before they even truly understand what the question is and what the answer is actually going to provide. So your advice is to keep it simple and to keep it straightforward and maybe even start off in the beginning with something which is accomplishable, right? Absolutely. Sure. And, and, and one thing I just will add is that no matter where you end up as far as the presentation, the data analytics or whatever, you have to take the first step and that is getting the information from a device to some cloud server somewhere. And once you've accomplished that, that then you can find tremendous other uses for that same piece of information. Okay. Bill, I mentioned before that Standard Electric's been involved in providing IIoT solutions to customers for many years. So how have we helped customers make these projects successful? What do you think in the past has been the keys there? Well, I think, uh, you know, starting out back in the really the late 90s, we really, we dial-up modems. Does anybody remember those? I, oh, yeah. There's a few people I can see. But uh, 
you know, dial-up modems are primarily used to do alarms and things like that to let us know what's going on with the project. The other part was trying to get somebody to that site, you know, because we didn't have a lot of remote capability. Um, then we, we started getting into Iconics in the early 2000s, and we started using the, the OPC tunneling and be able to do the Internet Explorer and being able to kind of do things remotely. Um, but really, I think the big thing that got us into this was the, uh, the E1 product in 2010. So when we signed up, and the remote connectivity part, I think, is really what steered us into getting more involved with the uh, IIoT products, you know. So instead of sending a service rep down to their facilities, we could remotely take care of the PLC issues and potentially HMI issues, timing, and things like that. And then eventually they got into video and be able to, the technician could see what's going on with that machine. So I think that's where we've started to help solve problems with uh, IILT. How do we help customers be successful? Is it just a one guy type of thing or is it a group thing or what do you, what do you it see It is totally there? a group effort. Really? You know, it, it really is, all the way from the top down. But the hardest thing initially in, you know, in Syncrator was, you know, one of our customers where we got involved with the IT um, group. We didn't really deal with IT very well. We didn't know who IT was or what you guys did. Didn't know you guys had basically an endless checkbook. Um, but uh, the, the neat thing was that once you start getting involved with the IT groups, um, a lot of things opened up for us. And um, the production side of Syncorator is all with Iconics, and it, it got us involved with other parts of the, um, group, you know, the companies. Um, but that's a big thing, and getting the CEOs and CFOs involved. Again, it's not our greatest thing. That's where our management um, has those connections. Some of our account management really don't. Um, so it's, it's been a struggle on that part of it. Okay, good. Now, there's lots of communication protocols. We talked about the model. You know, we have the connected products. We have the edge in the middle. We have the cloud. And there's a lot of protocols that you can use to get information between those areas there. And sometimes they can be confusing. So, John, can you tell everybody what are the two or three key protocols that are used and where do they fit? Sure. So, uh, you need something. Uh, you need something that's going to be lightweight. There's several different methodologies you can implement as far as uh, queuing messages to send them up to a server. Or, in other words, a broker is another commonly used phrase in the industry. Um, but some of the common protocols that get used are MQTT that you may have heard of, AMQP, um, you have Stomp protocol, COAP, there's many different method, methodologies. Probably one for machine to machine data that's been uh, more popular or gained a lot of traction recently has been MQTT, which was developed in 1999 by uh, a bunch of uh, engineers at IBM. And it's gone through stages. In 2018, they came out with version 5. Um, but what it is basically is a messaging, queuing, uh, telemetry, uh, transport um, system that has a publish and subscribe model. And you have topics, and you send the information from the client to the server. The server would reside on your edge device. And that edge device is going to get the information um, from the client devices. Typically, it's sensors. So you want low overhead, very simple system. So MQTT kind of enables that. Good. So Brian and Scott, were these decisions you had to make? How do they implement or impact your implementation? Brian? Okay. Uh, yeah, they, they did impact us. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, all of our sites are remote. And we're, we decided at the time of launch that we did not want to tie into our customers' internet uh, for security purposes. So we went cellular on everything. Um, that being said, we didn't want to just send tons of packets of data. We had to be aware of the cost behind that when you have customers across the country. Um, there's a monthly fee to that, right? So uh, we did look at, like I said, lightweight. And what can we do lightweight? Uh, we looked at, um, I think we started with Modbus uh, with the packets, and then it got pretty heavy for us. And then uh, we, we ended up, uh, part, of the, part of one of the pivots we made, as I mentioned again earlier, when we went to Red Lion, Red Lion had a really nice MQTT 
kind of client built into the into the device. Uh, and it was lightweight, we learned, it was a learning process, and uh, it kind of just, I don't want to say, uh, force is not the right word, but it really just guided us, the, mm -hmm. the tools that we had, to, to go try MQTT. And, and it worked, we got our costs, our monthly costs per, per site, for the data charges are really low. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we beat our target by you know, like 100%, you know, it, it's, it worked out really well for us. And uh, in, in addition to that, um, uh, what Redline gave us was uh, you know, the remote connectivity, remote management that we were looking for. Uh, we have these sites that we can dial into from from our office if we need to do change settings of settings of the program, tweak uh, the water usage uh, on the fly. You know, we can we can do that remotely from uh, from our office. Uh, so so we, yeah, the, the Redline gave us not only MQ protocol kind of built in uh, the gives our whole management. Great. Okay. Scott, how about you? Was that a consideration, these different protocols? Actually, uh, it wasn't. Like, from, an, from an end user internally, all of our SCADA system, hyper storian, the, uh, the, H, uh, the HMIs, all of that's hosted per site. So we're just using, uh, with Iconix, you know, we've got the, the Kepler OPC server, you know, OPC industry standard. So we're really just using just simple TCP IP, you know, communication. We're just being able to go right into uh, Rockwell or Siemens tag and pull out a float or, or you know, an integer or, or a value out of that. So it wasn't, it's not a concern of us right now. Once we decide where we're we looking at migrating into the cloud, uh, that will be a concern for us. Got it, okay. So talking about the cloud, customers can choose where to store data, whether it's on the edge or in their own facility or on the cloud. Mike, uh, can you talk about should customers push data to the cloud and, uh, or if they have a local server, should they keep it there? What should be some of those considerations? Well, the big advantage of uh, utilizing IoT for solving some of your problems Certainly you can do a lot of these things on a local level, and in some cases it may be truly justified, particularly if you have uh, actionable items that need a fast response and they want to do that locally. Um, but uh, there are cloud solutions that are available to you day one that are very, uh, can be very complex and very comprehensive such as data analytics that you don't have to spend a lot of time and investment to create your own uh, platforms to solve your particular problems. So there are plenty of uh, opportunities out there for utilizing the cloud. And uh, you may find out, and I think really, most people probably are gonna have a hybrid approach where they have, you're gonna hear a lot of more conversation about uh, the power at the edge. And the edge has kind of changed a little bit in the description where today it's really talking about edge computing, where it used to be just talking about edge devices. Now you really have edge computing that is kind of taking a hybrid approach, like I mentioned earlier, where you have some local actionable items, but then you utilize the power of some of the cloud solutions for uh, predictive maintenance, uh, long-term historians perhaps, uh, and uh, perhaps some dashboards for different customer groups, maybe some alarm management, uh, if those are the type of things you want to utilize. Okay. Scott, you mentioned you're not using the cloud right now, but is that something that's a consideration for the future? What would be some of those factors there? Yeah, um, basically cost yeah. is, is the biggest factor right now. Um, most of our locations, some of our smaller plants in China, Brazil, I mean, Buy a, we spend fifteen twenty thousand dollars for a, a server, spin up a couple of VMs, and we've got everything we need there. Uh, recently, we've made some of our lar uh, larger plants, including in Illinois, we've moved some of our hardware to off-site uh, co-locations. Uh, just if you guys don't know what that is, it's not the same as a cloud storage. A co-location is we're just sharing server space um, off-site but we're using our hardware, but we get the benefit of basically virtual uptime all the time and increased bandwidth for, uh, for those sites as well, too. Um, so we are going to investigate, excuse me, we are going to investigate eventually pushing stuff in the cloud. We are storing the data that we do. Once we get the data out of the SCADA system, we, um, 
in our SQL environment, we take the data and clean it up, you know, aggregate all that data, put it into the, the, the views that everybody likes. That actually gets pushed up in the cloud, and as you saw on my slide, that's what everybody, from VPs down to the machine operators, they can look at their phone, a tablet, or whatever, through the cloud-based system to actually see the head data. Okay, okay. Brian, how about you? That's something, you're already doing that, yeah. right? Well, the, what we did is we, we partnered with AT&T uh, early on, and uh, we are utilizing their, their software on the cloud, the MDAX and, and Flow uh, Designer. Uh, the data goes up through, through AT&T's cloud, and uh, the processing happens there. And, uh, and we've created a VPN, actually, between the, uh, our, our server and theirs. As I mentioned, the remote monitoring back and forth. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but yeah, our data is, uh, we're using the at and cloud for that. Okay, okay. And by the way, if anybody out here has any questions, we have a microphone, a remote microphone, we'd like to have you ask a question. I see you have an answer question. Yeah, in the yeah this, is, this is for Scott. You have uh, extrusion equipment and injection molded equipment. Do you yes. have aux equipment that supports that, chillers, temperature control? Yes. Uh, do you guys monitor any <laughs> Why? Uh, um, internally, yeah, we actually use, uh, I would say we don't do it on all the equipment, but uh, out in California, the HVAC units, uh, in Australia, uh, same thing with the temperature control. The, the, the drastic temperature in Australia, from hot to cold, affects the bubble that we make for the film intrusion, so we have to monitor that as well. Too. Yep. Good. Thanks for asking that question. For the same event. It wasn't that. <laughs> but you had a good, strong voice. Anybody else have any questions, by the way? Stan. That's for Brian. Brian, as an OEM, obviously there's a cost to implementing uh, the, the solution to be able to monitor. And you guys are providing a service by monitoring and be able to provide data to mm -hmm. your end users. How do you monetize that? And, and, and you know, it's all about the bottom line. And, and yeah. how do you monetize that service? Like, you know, we, or I'll say, we partner with customers that are sustainable. You know, the, the whole foods of the world that are willing to pay to get the data. You know, there's there's regulations, and I forget how many states now, probably seven states that are banning food from landfills, and and those are our target areas. And what they need to do provide this information showing that this is how much food we've diverted. It's, it really comes down to the sustainability reporting for us. And, and again, one of the, the charts I showed earlier, if a customer has multiple sites, they can start using this as a, a trending tool for a visibility of what's going on across their sites. And, and they can sometimes bring down their, their scrap within a store if they see that something's <laughs> trending the wrong way. So I think there's value to them and, and they're willing to pay for it. So there's a, if you think about customers and the, the universe of machines, it's possible they could look and say, well, why is my machine, machine running differently than somebody else's machine? I mean, that might be something they're willing to pay for, they want to know about, right? Yeah, I, the, the one chart I showed you, you, we have four stores. If you, if you own four grocery stores and, and one of them had twice as much food waste going through the system in a week than another store, you want to question that, right? Your shrink. If you, the, you can reduce your, you know, your scrap just by looking at a chart every week. And right. That's what they're, that's what they're doing. Yeah. So, so if it's something you can measure, you can do something about that. Right. Good. Who else has a question out here? I think I saw another hand out here somewhere. Yeah. Here. Um, Take mic. Now we just sold. We supply from to other people. Talk in the microphone. Oh. We supply and equipment to other people. We do crane controls. So we probably put out a thousand different crane controls a year. How do, what's the best way for IT, what information do they need to allow us to get on the internet to get this information out? Because not only do we have trouble with the company's ITs that we're going through, we have problems with our internal IT <coughs> dealing with them. So what information would you need or would you guys like to see that helps this process continue? You want me to answer that one? <laughs> uh, that's a really great question, and I struggle that 
from the equipment side when I was helping them out. Um, we, as I said before, our OEM fillers, you know, our machines are one piece of a big line of machines. You get the, 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 the loaders, the case packers, the program loaders and everything. So the OEE of the customer line, our machine is just one piece. We started putting this E1 device on there because communicating with their IT and back and forth, of, we're going to set up a VPN. Some sites would allow me to do custom VPNs, and some sites, smaller companies, they had no clue how to set that up. So we, this E1 thing was perfect. We stick it in every single machine, whether or not the customer wants to use it or not, whether it's a wireless or wired, you plug the thing in. If you, I, I have to, I created a document. Uh, from Sholey that say it shows how the E1 is secure. We won't see your network. You can't see our network through through the E1 device. Um, I even went to so it, it is a struggle because all that you need to do is I need an internet connection. Some you know we're we're past the days of the dial-up modem. Yeah. You got to be able to you got to have wireless in manufacturing or a wired connection. So that's where the E1 comes in. Just get me on your network. And the E1 will connect, and I can then through a cloud-based secure connection, my my team can get into that machine and see that and service that machine. Um, I'll add to that. I had a conversation about a couple of years ago with a uh, cola company that refused to do the E1 because it wasn't their standard device. And I talked to their whole IT team. Me being an IT team couldn't convince them because it wasn't their standard. I said, look, this, this E1 has this ability to do a digital input output. We can, my control engineers can wire up a simple box that they might help me do this. Hey, here's a schematic. You do a wire up on off that can turn on or off the internet. You keep, instead of you having to plug in and plug out the cable, which most companies will do to disable you, leave the thing plugged in. Here's an on off switch that will at your facility, when we need it, you can turn the internet on or turn it off. And that's all. That they have the control now to turn on or off the connection to the machine. So uh, it's, 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 uh, you, it's, it, there's a lot of information to provide. But the E1, like I said, if, if, you under, if you can understand that it is a secure connection, and if all they need to do is provide a wireless or wired connection to that device, they can turn on or off the internet if they feel uncomfortable or the security is not there. Um, uh, is, does that answer the question? <laughs> but if you turn it off, how do you plug it in? That that is that is a good that is a good point. You know, if, if I'm talking from a perspective of my field service need need data for a short period of time, like a few days. If I'm doing SCADA monitoring, um, we've done, I've used the E1, uh, e, what's that? As a buffer. As a buffer, because the E1, I've done this, uh, we have this in, uh, machine in Europe where the E1 has an IO server built into it, so some of the E1 modules. So we buffer the data there, and Mr. Void has shown me how to do, like, put FTP, I can, I can spit that out to an FTP server or SMS text messaging. Um, Another method I've used the E1s for is in Brazil. Uh, E1 had a device called an Indian. Now it's called an E5. 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 So it's an appliance. It looks like a 25 port switch. I put that in my data center. And then instead of talking through the eCatcher cloud, the E1 on my machines in Brazil talked directly to my E5. It's a secure connection live 24-7 that never drops out. And it's a, essentially a site-to-site -site tunnel to the machines, and that's how I can get my data live all the time. But again, the customer, my end customer, needs to provide that internet connection. If I prove to that uh, that I'm going to get them the data, the valuable data, usually they will give us either a wired or wired connection to the machine. Or in the case of Brian, I think you just use the cellular. You just kind yeah. of skip that, in, right? In, in well, one of uh, one of the divisions of Emerson, our, our sister divisions, uh, was on the path of using connecting to the customer's uh, internet, and they started to see the trend of getting kicked off. Um, the bigger companies, you know, like the cola companies or the WalMarts, is it more secure if you can get off our network? And they they guided us in the right path, and 
right out of the gates we went cellular. So they, they don't care. We put a system in sight, turn it on, and then that's it. It's everything cellular. I, I would only like to add, as Mike had mentioned, with 5G coming, and uh, most people may not be aware, the cost of cellular has dropped dramatically in the last few years, where now the cost of having a cellular connection is very economical. Uh, where years ago it was uh, kind of costly for the data, it's no longer the case. Yeah. The only problem we've had with cellular and some of the machines, um, we didn't go that route because some machines are literally out in the middle of nowhere. Location. In, in Ukraine and yeah. somewhere in the middle of Brazil. So it's a little difficult for us to do that. But yeah. 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 <laughs> Unfortunately, cellular is still location, location, location. And, and we run into that. Got it. Yeah, depending on the area. Good question. Anybody else have a good question out here? Where's the that one? <laughs> there you go. Hi, so this is kind of for anybody, but do you see a project for IoT? Is it a IT-led project? Is it an engineering-led project? Who do you normally see kind of take the lead on that? So we're kind of engineering, we're going to push IT to do something. You know, they've already got their own thing, so I'm just curious how you've kind of seen it. Um, throughout business. I'll answer that one. From when, uh, when Standard Electric first came into Sholey and started helping us um, with the SCADA project using Iconics, um, the team that actually started it was the our continuous improvement engineering team. So it was basically my end users building a system for our end users. And they really had little IT involvement. Uh, I got it involved with the project a few years after it started because honestly the project would have failed if they didn't get full support of IT. It got too big too fast. You absolutely, it's a, it's a team effort. You and it's have, a, you have to have management involved. You have to have management, I mean yeah, executive management, senior management, the, the end users in IT all have to be involved. To this day, I mean, there's still plants, plant managers that are still on the fence, but their end users want it, and they're just not moving forward. When they retire, they'll change yeah. over. <laughs> yeah. so. But it's really a team effort. It's it absolutely really is. a team effort. Yeah, and just to, just to add on to that, I agree. We Our project started in engineering. Here's the sensors we want. Here's the things we want to monitor. And what do we do with it? And we didn't know as an engineering team. We had to get IT involved. But, you know, how do we, uh, what's it going to take to get this up? Out here. Yeah, there's a, just to add to that too, I mean to this day when we get new machines in, uh, I'll still go out there, I'll, I'll put my bump cap on and walk, walk the floor and uh, I'm sure there's a lot of faces looking, why is an IT guy out here, you know, in the manufacturing plant? Well, I'm helping the maintenance engineers and the controls engineers, we're working together to get this machine on the network, they tell me that I, I give them the tags. You, you add that, you know, I need a cycle count, I need some scrap uh, as a product, and then once they can provide a program that into the PLC, I'll get that data collected and give you a report on that. So it's a total team out there. So you need an example of the IT OT collaboration, right? Absolutely. We yeah. need a lot more customers with IT backing like this. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Any other questions out here? Where? Okay, fine. Oh, I'm sorry, right here. Sorry, let somebody sit down. You talked about um, machines installed in multiple facilities around the world. I'm wondering, are they running similar processes? And so by doing that, do you see that the, the different facilities now start to almost kind of compete with each other to measure their efficiencies and things like this? Because the question I'm really trying to get to is ultimately the cost benefit of doing the implementation. Right? How do you, it takes a lot of time, effort, work in order to get there. How do you justify all of the cost numbers? What type of returns do you, can you actually see? Um, so to answer the first question is yes. They, the reports that I build, every site can see each other's machines. Um, by department, we have the automated bag machines that basically make the same product, the injection molding machines, the extrusions. So. Each machine has you know, recipes. We, we know what we need to make, what we're capable of making. Um, 
where it varies depends upon uh, you know, our plant in Virginia that supports Coca-Cola, they don't have this few changeover, so they have minimal scrap. They, they have a higher uptime than some of our other plants that has different uh, SKU numbers that we've designed. So it's easy to see that right in the reports right away, uh, who's, which machines are running better. Um, the benefit, the payback that we're getting, I, again, me from an IT perspective, you know, I'm providing the business the data. Here's, here's the reports from the end user to the executives to drive this business to see how things are going. Um, it's, it, it is a little bit hard to put a number on that. I, I know my boss, the, the vice president, he, we can see payback. For example, uh, as Mike said early on, when we started this project, you know, we talked about reducing scrap and looking for uh, uh, product failures and things like that. It took a few hours to realize, uh, sitting in a room, that we have administrative people at different plants manually entering uh, adjustments into the system. Um, we just figured just a few hours, by base spot, the hours of manual input. I mean, we could just that alone could save several million dollars a year, reducing the admin cost of data entry in, in our SCADA system, Re regardless of what OEE our machines are running. You know, it's it's we're finding now, believe it or not. Yes, we have the visuals of the OEE, which is great, but the bottom line is we need to see what we need to produce and what we are producing. We want those numbers, those. Those product numbers is not just an OEE number. That's going to help drive our business and give us a better profitability. And Scott, one thing I remember you telling me last week is that you get that data so much quicker. So it doesn't take you hours or days. It's basically minutes now, right? Yeah. Uh, well, it's not minutes, but when we started this, uh, we had different different shifts, eight-hour shifts or twelve-hour shifts. So our data aggregation after it was from hyper story and we processed that data our reports were coming out about two three hours after the end of the last shift so it could be the next day that australia sees the data or whatever um, recently with my it development team we uh, simplified the data collection of what we want the core tags we need and the formulas that we generate all this data from and now within two hours of the current shift basically that, that Microsoft uh, Power BI report that's historical is now updated within two hours. Good, good. Any other questions at all? All right, so we kind of come to the end of the presentation, so I'm gonna let the panelists take a minute or so just to kind of give a quick summary on what you've talked about here, say what you think is important. So one or two things that are important for the audience to take away. So John, how about you, can you start first? Say you need a, a good, simple protocol to get the data up to the, either your, your private server in-house or a cloud server. Got it. Okay. Phil, how about you? Well, I'm selfish, so I just want everybody to think about Standard Electric and all the products that we have to offer. <laughs> <laughs> so everything from the SCADA software side with Schneider Electric and Siemens and Tatsoft and Iconics, um, our Edge hardware, don't forget that. Many of the same companies. The red line that you mentioned, the uh, uh, all the network uh, backbone communications, uh, the Ethernet switches, the wireless, the routing capabilities that we have, um, and then the wireless sensors for our predictive maintenance and things like that with ADB and Grace. So I, I just wanted to be get some of that advertising in. Thank you. <laughs> we'll give them the commercial. Good. Mike, how about you? What what would you like to leave the audience with? Um, <clears throat> to kind of leverage a little bit off Bill, I think that the real problem in understanding IT, there's a huge gap between the OT and IT world that is coming together, but there's still a large gap there. And, uh, we actually understand the OT world and what the IT uh, world needs, and we're coming in from the operational side of things, and as Bill mentioned, we have multiple products that can get information from the OT world communicate that to the IT world and a lot of the protocols that John had mentioned. So you utilize some, someone like Standard Electric to help guide you in a relatively cost-effective way to go from the OT world to the IT world. And don't get hung up 
in specific products or specific platforms. But just start with a simple project so that you can see getting data and what it can do for you and where you can go from there. Great. Okay. Brian, how about you? I think uh, be prepared to pivot. We, we started down a path and we pivoted twice and we ended up you know, having a seed with, with our solution and it worked. It was great. So I would say be prepared to pivot. And then one other thing uh, I feel is important is um, you know, try to understand the data you're collecting. And what I mean by that is we were able to eliminate sensors on the field that we, we wanted to know every time the, the tank was pumped out. So we put sensors on the valves and the things there. And as we're collecting data and put it in the cloud and we're analyzing it, we realize we can predict and, and we know when things open and close just by tank levels and, and timing of when the system's on and off. So we end up eliminating some of the sensors from our from our solution. Uh, we can predict fill rates now. We can do things with the data that we didn't really expect to get initially. Uh, so we started by just throwing everything out and then back into it. In. So I, okay, those are the two things I want to do. So be open to you know making changes. So be totally you know uh, committed to a certain direction. Be open to possible changes and also the the new things you get you learn about that as well. So yeah, okay. Scott, how about you? Last but not least here. Yeah, the, uh, I think the biggest takeaway is, you know, we've said it before, is just to keep it simple. You know, just focus on one aspect of the project, uh, an IoT project, you know, get your return on investment and, and grow. It surely, we could have been a lot farther along than we are by now if the, the original team that started the project wouldn't have taken on so much. I mean, they, there was a, there was a meeting one time I had where they were saying, well, we don't know what we want to collect on the machine, so we're going to put a hundred some sensors on the machine to collect all of this temperature and dwell and pressure and everything, and they needed it for a green belt event or something. We spent too much money on so much detail, collecting so much data. Just keep it simple, focus on the basics. We're learning now that we can, like, like he said, just we're, uh, one of my engineers, can do statistical process analysis just on the basic alarms that we can get, and we can find faults and trends in that data alone without all of these extra sensors and spending thousands of dollars. So keeping it simple. Keeping it simple. Good, good. I think it's a great way to wrap it up is to keep it simple. So I want to thank our panelists for joining us today. Obviously, the fan breakfast office, but also Brian and Chuck for taking time out of their busy work days to come here and share their experiences with you. And so Standard Electric is here to help you. As you know, we have a lot of solutions, a lot of tools, a lot of good people. So let's help you with your next project.